The majority of our behavior, by the way, every day is not controlled by the law, it's controlled by social norms. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that if you start making things like offense a legal matter and subject to penal uh, uh, sanctions, then you're going to have problems. Hello, this is Fadima Gunning and you're watching Grip Media. Today I have Professor Jared Casey in the studio with me and we're going to discuss a range of issues like the Garda National Diversity and Integration Unit. Professor Casey, can you tell us what exactly the Garda Diversity and Integration Unit is? Well, it's something I discovered existed only a very short time ago and I suspect that most people in Ireland are completely unaware <laughs> of this particular division of the Gardaí. It's a, uh, they can go online, by the way, so none of this is being made up. They can find, they can find it, uh, the information online. And it says, if, if you, I'll have to read this because it's long, but it says the role of the, of the unit is to monitor hate crime and hate-related incidents um, and to develop policy strategy in all areas of diversity and so on and so forth. And of course, the interesting thing there is about hate crime and hate speech, especially in the context of the very likely passing of the new Hate Crime Act uh, by the Dáil. And in that documentation, it kind of lays out where there is a particular focus on the guards trying to prevent issues against people who are from kind of different ethnic backgrounds. Can you tell us a little yeah, bit more it, about it, that? It is very interesting. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from the, their policy document, so I'm not making this up, and anybody can find this. And it, it's called Responding to Hate Crimes and Non-Hate Crime. One of the um, things that's easily confused is, and this is in the new act, is there is a distinction between hate crime mm -hmm. and hate speech. Okay. All right, And within the context of hate crime, there's a distinction between hate crime, properly speaking, and hate incidents which are non-criminal. What, what could that I'll be? I'll come back to that in a second, <laughs> okay. okay? But let me answer your first question, which is, it says, on Garda Shikona is committed to protecting the safety, well-being and rights of all. That's fine. Who could possibly object to that? Comma. Then it says, particularly diverse minority and marginalized communities and individuals. And is there any definition of that language? No, 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 there isn't. And I find this, well, this is, this is disturbing for a number of reasons. First of all, I don't know why any section of the Irish community or people living in Ireland should be more protected mm. uh, or their safety or well-being or their rights better protected than any other. That sounds like discrimination. This actually sounds like institutionalized discrimination which is not what you want. And then, so it refers to them as diverse, marginalized, and minority. And you, you can, lots of people can fit into that, right? But uh, in the context of the current uh, discussions, you might think, for example, of uh, controversies relating to transgender, for example. Or, and, and, there, and there's lots of things. I mean, there would be obviously racial considerations there or whatever it might be. Um, so I find that extremely disturbing that this should be, if you like, part of the policy of the National Police Force of Ireland, that some groups are to be better protected, served, uh, and their rights better defended than others. And I suppose a lot of those things like, you know, physical assaults or the destruction of property, those things are already illegal. Yes, yes. So now well, let's come back to the, the thing yeah. I started with. So, so what is a hate crime? Well, a hate crime is something that's already a crime. Okay. Okay. Uh, but for which the motive is taken to be or is perceived to be by the victim or by anybody else, for that matter, which is also incredibly <laughs> subjective. By a third party by either. By a third party is perceived to be hate. So could that be somebody that's not immediately involved in the situation? Well, I don't know how far that extends. Okay. Okay, it might be somebody to whom the story was related. It might be somebody who was sitting by in a restaurant overhearing a remark. So, uh, for example, I mean, if I, um, if I mug you and I take your wallet, mm -hmm. right, that's a crime. Yeah. But if you were to say that the reason I did this, the mo my motive for doing it was because I hated women, and how you would know that other than the fact that it's stolen in your wallet is another thing, right? Then what difference does that make? It makes a difference in the sentencing that would apply 
to me if I'm caught and convicted of the offense. So if I'm convicted uh, for the offense of mugging you and stealing your wallet, I get, let's say, tariff X, mm -hmm. right? But if it's, now, if it's shown to be a hate crime, I get tariff X plus delta. I get another increment for the hate factor. Mm -hmm. Now, this is really disturbing. The reason why somebody commits a crime is relevant to the detection of the criminal. Mm -hmm. It's not relevant to the nature of the crime. Mm -hmm. In other words, whether the person stealing your wallet hates women, loves women, uh, is kind to cats, whatever, makes no difference whatsoever. It's a crime. And the crime is the same, it committed, whoever it's committed by and whomever it is committed against. So the whole thing about hate crime is that certain categories of people, and here we're back again, you see, to the thing that links into the policy document, certain categories of people are afforded special protection in that it's sort of prima facie assumed that if a crime is committed against them, then the, in fact, the Garda officer is required at the point of you know, uh, arriving to figure out what's going on to determine if there was a hate element. So would the guard then have to ask for me, for example, I'm actually, I'm mixed race myself. So mm. would it be, would it be a, a worse, would it be worse for somebody to oh, yeah. mug me than you? Yes. Because you're, you're a male, you're, you're Irish. Yeah. I'm all the wrong things, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yeah. Like where I'm a female, I'm yeah. a mixed race, half Irish, half Pakistani. Like it, yeah. by, by our intrinsic nature, it's more of a crime to kind of hurt me. You know, I, I doubt very much that my protestations that the, the crime had been affected against me by virtue of a motive of hate would be taken seriously, mm -hmm. but it would by you. And, and therefore, so what, what this does then is, and in the new act, we have a whole list. I think there are 10 characteristics that are listed, including gender, by the way. Including gender. And gender, not sex. Okay. And so that's the completely kind of subjective yeah. kind of GRA stuff. Exactly. Okay. I mean, it may well be that uh, some person mugged uh, a person who's transgender, completely unaware of it, but I mean, if the person who was mugged uh, from their point of view, subjectively thought that this was the reason that it was done, then um, that's what determines literally what, that's what makes it to be a hate crime. But even if that person didn't think that was the reason, and like, you know, if you have your, your personal belongings stolen from you, mm. like I completely understand why you would want that person to be prosecuted of to the course. full extent of the law. Yeah. Is there anything to kind of stop, you know, flawed human beings from saying, well, I think it was this, so person gets sentence X plus add on why. What do you think the answer to that question is? I'd probably say no. No, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> because it's completely subjective. Mm -hmm. So this is hate crime. Now, hate crime is, as, because you can see from the nature of it, it's not, a, not primarily individual. It's, it's, it's directed towards, uh, allegedly, if you like, the protection of groups who are particularly susceptible to hate. But here's another question. Why hate? Because hate is not only the only factor uh, that could motivate a crime. There's jealousy, envy, a desire for another person's goods, right? Why are we choosing to penalize what is effectively a psychological attitude, un undesirable as it may be, I mean, I'm not defending it, okay? But why are we penalizing this one? as distinct from others. I mean, you might say, well, most murders are committed, are motivated by hate, but I would say, no, probably not. Many murders are, are probably motivated by a desire to take somebody else's property, or who knows what it might Even be. Even jealousy is... But jealousy. Too. I mean, again, so, so the law traditionally has never been in the business of, as it were, of peering into the mind of the criminal. Motive is relevant to detection. But in terms, of the commit, in terms of the prosecution of a crime, the motive is irrelevant. Right, it's Largely right. irrelevant, it's nothing to do. Now, there is a mental element in crime, not, which is called intention. So, for example, um, in, in homicide, we distinguish between murder and manslaughter in relation to intention. But intention here is part of the nature of the act that's committed. If I attack you intending to cause your death or serious injury and you die, then if I'm convicted of that, that's murder. If, however, 
we have a scuffle outside a pub late at night over some trivial thing and I hit you and you fall down, <clears throat> you crack your head on the pavement and you die. Clearly, in that situation, it's unlikely that my intention was to cause death or serious injury. And therefore, even though the result is homicide of an individual, we would think of that as manslaughter. So there is, if you like, an area of law in which a mental element is relevant, but not motive. And what about premeditation? Premeditation, again, because that's a factor. In other words, if I left a record, I've, I've written down, I hate this person and I'm going to kill her and I've spoken to my friends about it and I go in and I pick a fight and so on. So, yeah, this is what a jury will decide. This is what we have juries for. So the jury will have to decide in a particular case whether the person intended and part of the evidence of intent is something like premeditation. And will the, the hate crime legislation, will that in practice include a kind of a jury to establish whether the hate motive was legitimate? Or I don't know. You don't know. Who knows? Uh, the, it should, right? And uh, But again, whether or which, the point is, I don't see why this should in fact be relevant. Okay, and again, it's all part of the particularization of particular groups uh, 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 as being worthy of defense. Now, I also think, by the way, that hate crime laws are counterproductive. And so let me explain why. If somebody is resentful of a me of particular group, say a particular migrant group, as, as being the unworthy and undeserving recipients of social welfare or benefits, uh, which are not available, let's say, to the native population. This would be a consideration obviously relevant in the current context. If a person thinks that a group is the, is the recipient of special benefits, how much do you think they're going to be disabused of that notion if there is a piece of legislation which specifically sets out in its charter to say that these groups are, in fact, the recipient of special benefits? Can you talk to us a little bit about the uh, interesting Garda sign you saw? Oh yes, indeed. So, I mean, we're back, we're back now to our Garda Diversity and Integration Unit. And uh, so what's interesting is that um, it's, the Garda you now have signs uh, out there uh, literally touting for business. What do you mean? <laughs> well, in other words, they're advertising saying, if you've got a problem, come and tell us. And they say, um, our job is to encourage, this is again, it's from their policy document, and facilitate reporting, to encourage and facilitate reporting of all hate crimes and what they call hate incidents are, is shorthand, and they say themselves, for non-crime hate incidents. Now remember, a hate crime is a crime, something that's already a something crime. Something that's already illegal, motivated. plus the motivation Mo yeah. of hatred. Okay, but a non-crime hate incident would be something which someone the putative victim or a third party perceives as being hateful, but which isn't yet a crime. And that's going to be recorded. The Guardi are now going to be recording, setting up a record of non-crime hate incidents. And this is extremely problematic. And we have, um, we have evidence of this in what happened in the UK. In the UK, uh, the British police forces recorded something in the region of 75,000 non-crime hate incidents. 75,000? Yes, 75. Uh, it's, a big, it's a big place, large population. Yeah. I don't know, let's say over 10 years. I can't remember exactly, so don't quote me on that. Um, but the point was that this information was available, for example, to employers. So that somebody going for a job, having their record checked, would find, could find, for example, that they had been... By the way, they might not even know they but might not even know that that was on their record. They might not even know, yes, that there was a non-crime hate incident recorded against their name. And of course, if you're an employer and you're choosing between candidates and somebody has something like this, you think, well, I don't need any trouble, do I? Okay. So this came to a head when a, an ex-police officer, uh, Harry Miller, was visited by a police officer uh, on the basis of a tweet he had retweeted, which was considered to be transphobic. In other words, offensive to people who are transgender. And <clears throat> he said, well, have I committed the crime? And the, and the police officer said, no, but we need, I find this, this a phrase just really, really disturbing. We need to check your thinking. 
Your thinking. We need to check your thinking. And see, I come back to the point that hate crime, if you think about it, so the crime is a crime because somebody smacks you in the face or steals your wallet. The crime is literally a physical event that happens. Somebody steals your property, somebody assaults you. But the hate is an internal psychological dimension in terms of the motive. So this is going to sound strange, but I mean it deadly seriously. A hate crime is a thought crime because the extra punishment you're getting for your crime is for the thought element. And however much we might deprecate hatred and its effects, there are lots of other things we could deprecate as well. And why is it that all of a sudden that the, <clears throat> the courts and the law are now concerned about peering into, as it were, as, as Queen Elizabeth might say, men's souls to look at what would be, if you like, a spiritual problem, if anything, but is now regarded as a legal problem. The non-crime hate incident, of course, is even more problematic because it's not a crime. And given the subjective nature of the reporting and the recording, it means that you could find yourself uh, on the record for all sorts of hate crime incidents. I mean, I've written a book uh, on transgender and I had to be extremely careful uh, in what I said uh, I suspect that if I were to write it now in the UK or even here, or if I were to write it, say, and publish it in six months' time after the likely passage of the Hate Crime Act, I could well find myself in legal trouble. But if it's a non-criminal incident, why are the guards involved? <laughs> exactly. And moreover, why are they asking people to tell them about this? Again, look... Uh, we would all like to live in a society where people are civil and well behaved and are not rude to one another and are not deliberately offensive to one another. That's fine. But the norms that control these matters in a, in a civilized society are non-penal laws. They're non-criminal laws. Right. That's their kind. They're kind of like their social implications for that kind of exactly. behavior. Exactly. There are measures of social control in the same way that, that, I mean, if people have obnoxious eating habits, we tend not to invite them to lunch. Right. So there, the, 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 the majority of our behavior, by the way, every day is not controlled by the law. It's controlled by social norms. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that a if you start making things like offence a legal matter and subject to penal uh, uh, sanctions, then you're going to have problems. And one of the problems is, and this is one of the ones that concerns me really, is that as the uh, Court of Appeals in the UK pointed out in the Harry Miller case, this has a chilling effect on free speech. It's very, very problematic. And so suppose... Uh, in the course of a heated discussion, I say something rude to you and offensive, which could happen. Well, that's impolite. Okay. And should there be criminal consequences? Be, yeah, exactly. Or should I go on record? Or should I be put on a police record for that? Okay. I think some people might say, you know, um, that if, if you have nothing kind of hateful to say or do, you have nothing to fear. In, in, mm. What would you say to that? <laughs> yeah, that, that's like the people who, are, who say, well, there's no reason why you should worry about the, the government sort of recording everything you say and so on, because if you have nothing to fear, so on, and the answer, yeah, uh, yes. The trouble is here that <clears throat> what's considered to be hateful is a moving target, right? So uh, I can say, for example, as I have done in my book on transgender, that from a libertarian, which is written from a libertarian point of view, from a legal and social perspective, I don't care what anybody does in that sense, okay? As long as they don't frighten the horses, okay? If you want to wear a dress, if you're Jared and you call, and you call yourself Geraldine and wear a dress, from a legal and social perspective, I don't care. That's not a problem for me. I might think it idiotic, I might think it's stupid, but that's in a sense. But you have a right to think that it's idiotic. Oh yeah, but here, but I, yes, you would think so so far, but here's the point. If, and this is what's happened now, you see, under the law, under the Gender Recognition Act, which again, by the way, I suspect is something almost nobody in Ireland knows anything about, 2015, 
The, the relevant section of which, section 18, uh, subsection 1, says that if a person, blah, 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 goes through, you know, writes a form and makes an application to the minister and so on, and says they have a firm intention to live as the opposite sex, then they are the opposite sex. By just writing a letter and... Basically by, yes, by applying. You don't, you don't need any uh, psychological evaluation, you don't need any medical treatment, you don't need to go through any process of transition. And what would that entitle that person to participate in? Say Whatever, if it's a man uh, no, transitioning to... A woman, everything a woman's entitled to. Everything? Everything. I.e. like sports? Everything. Everything? Yes. With a capital E? Everything. Okay. And vice versa. Though the vice versa doesn't really count all that much, right? But it's normally the other way. Now here's the thing. Suppose then, and this brings us to something that's in the news, of course, which is the Enoch Burke case. I don't want to talk about that in detail, but I'll just say the following point. Suppose somebody then, I'm a teacher in a class, let's leave Mr. Burke to one side, but suppose I'm a teacher in a class and a student says to the principal, I have transitioned, I have, I've, now I am now, I was a boy, I am now a girl, I want to be called Susan and I want to be referred to as she. What are my obligations? Well, for one thing, I mean, from my point of view, I call yourself whatever name you like. I don't care. <laughs> okay, you want to call yourself Susan, go ahead. But I'm not going to refer to anybody who's biologically male as she. Now, here's the thing. In English, we don't address people in the third person. We might do it in Italian, for example, but we don't do it in English. So you only refer to people in the third person. And of course, in that case, since I have no wish to be impolite, but I also don't have a wish to tell a lie, I would refer to that person by their name. Mm -hmm. So, whereas in the case of the other students, I would say, hand him the pen. Yeah, you'd say, hand Susan the pen. I would hand Susan the pen, right? And we can get around it. And, but if, if the school were to say to me, oh, I'm sorry, but that won't do. This has happened elsewhere. You, you can't do that. You have to refer to all the children in the same way. And if you're going to refer to some using pronouns, you have to refer to Susan using pronouns. Now we have a problem. And here's where the issue lies, because now it's not, my, it's not me being tolerant, as I am, of other people's wishes to do strange things. It's of their rights, as they now have them under law, forcing me to effectively tell or live a lie. And that, by the way, is what is at the heart of the Enoch Burke uh, uh, situation. Whatever you think about what he's, what he's done and how he's been treated or treated it himself, that's another issue and I don't want to go into that. But that's at the heart of it and I can understand why he would have the problem that he does. And that's where it's problematic. And that's where, for example, continuing to refer to somebody uh, in the sex that they were would then be regarded as hate speech. But in terms of the, the kind of legislation surrounding the use of gender pronouns in schools, recently Junior Minister Mary Butler said that it was obliged by legislation for teachers to refer to, maybe in the Enoch Burke case, a male student who wishes to be referred to as they, I think it was, or even if it's she, or wishes to use a preferred name. She said that that was obligated by legislation now. Is that the case? I don't think so. I, I, I didn't, she didn't seem to cite the particular piece of legislation she had in mind. I approached her about it and I did see clarification and she refused to, to give me any. No comment was the response. Right. But uh, I suspect, however, that even if it's not the case now, right, and it may not be the case, it probably will be the case because that would kind of suit where the rest of what we were talking about is going. Yes, indeed, indeed. And that's where we're heading. And so we're heading into a situation where toleration is not enough. Participation is... In other words, you need... It, and we've seen this elsewhere. Toleration is not enough. You need to actively validate what somebody else is doing. And look, and I, I couldn't be more libertarian. I'm a libertarian through and through on all social and political matters. Right? It doesn't mean I don't have my views. I'm actually a social conservative, so I think lots of things that people are doing are incredibly stupid, okay? and some of them are vile, okay? and I reserve the right to speak in that thing. I don't do it from a libertarian point of view. I do it from a conservative social point of view. But uh, I want to be able to do that. I also want people who think that these things are just fine to be free to speak uh, out and to defend them if they so, so wish. I'm quite happy for a level playing field in this area, but other people are not and they want our freedom of speech constrained. 
so that it will, it will be almost impossible to express a view that's hostile to the current orthodoxy, no matter how nuanced it may be. Do you think that the word hate is being used to almost kind of like to gaslight people? You know, you, you can't kind of say anything. It's just it's they won't address the issue or speak yeah. with well, you. It's it, it, it's 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 a form of preemptive gagging. So that look, who wants to be like Harry Miller and have a police officer arrive at the door? Okay, most of us don't have anything to do with the police on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, and therefore, if the law is changed in such a way that there's even a remote possibility that in saying something or expressing an opinion, however moderate it might be, on an issue, you're going to get a visit from the boys in blue. Right? The chances are you're going to muzzle yourself. And that is the point. That is, that is in fact what's happened. It's not the actual number of convictions that might be uh, uh, prosecuted and carried through. It's the self-censorship that people will impose on themselves in order to avoid any possible harm. Again, you could think about it. Look, most people are in jobs or in, in, in uh, so on where their reputation is important. And can you imagine, I mean, you know, if you, you're, you're in some area where your employer suddenly discovers that you've had a visit from the police, they're thinking, oh, there's something funny going on. There's a, there's, a, there's a presumption that, as it were, that you are in the wrong in some way. And that's really, really problematic and no society should be ordered in that way.